Welcome, everyone. I'm going to wait a bit before we get started just to make sure everyone is able to log in okay. Okay, hopefully everyone is able to log in okay. Uh, we're going to start the webinar now. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. This is our webinar on five trends shaping CSR today. This is actually a sneak peek into one of our great industry specific sessions that we'll be covering at our annual BBCon conference. And for more on that conference, you can please visit us at bbconference.com. I'm your host, Daniel Marzo, Marketing Manager at Blackbaud. And I'm pleased to welcome today's presenter, Brittany Hill, CEO and co-founder of Catalyst. Today's webinar will be about 30 minutes with time for Q&A at the end. Uh, but before I get started, I'd like to go over a few things. First, after this webinar, you'll receive a link to a recording, which you can feel free to download it and forward it on to a friend or colleague if they could not join us today. We'll also be posting our presentation on our resource hub. If you haven't had a chance to visit our resource hub, please do so at corporations.blackbaud.com or you can find it directly through our blackbaud.com website. I encourage you to check out the hub. There's actually a ton of valuable information like this on there. And at the, any point of the webinar, feel free to use the Q&A widget on the screen. And it's located at the bottom. If you click on the Q&A button, you're able to ask any questions throughout the webinar and we'll be sure to answer them at the end. Lastly, don't forget the social conversation. You can access Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn right here during the webinar using the widgets on the screen. Simply log into the social channel of your choice and include us and your handle in a post. Our handle is blackbaudcs. With that, let's get started. Brittany, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Daniel, uh, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, as Daniel mentioned, my name is Brittany Hill, the CEO and co-founder at Catalyst. Um, and we appreciate you guys uh, coming to us today. We are very excited to talk about um, key trends that we see shaping the CSR and social impact space and landscape today. Um, we actually, a little bit more uh, before we dive into the trends and some of the methodologies that we've used to uncover these trends, um, a little bit more about us in case you don't know who we are. Uh, you can see there I am um, since we're not able to video conference today, but we do hope you all join us in person at the BBCon session that will be a continuation of this webinar and will feature some of our friends from the Ocean Conservancy, the National Park Foundation, and a few other corporate friends that will sit on a panel to discuss how these trends are really affecting and how they're using uh, and applying them in their partnerships uh, moving forward. Um, that's who I am, you can always find me there. Um, a little bit more about Catalyst if you don't know who we are. Uh, our team here collectively at Catalyst, we've sat in pretty much every social impact seat that you could think of, whether it be on the corporate social responsibility side, at uh, a variety of different companies that, uh, you know, maybe on the phone, maybe others. Uh, we've been nonprofit executives charged with raising money and building partnerships from the corporate sector. We've also sat in the consultancy seat that have built and, you know, established strategies on how both the, the two sectors should work together. Um, a couple years ago, we realized that there wasn't uh, a good solution to really tackle two of the key challenges that we knew, we heard, uh, from both the nonprofit and for-profit sectors. One, first and foremost, was finding the right partners. Second, was measuring those partnerships and the efficacy of those partnerships on the community and on the bottom line. And so at Catalyst, we decided to create a technology solution that has a high-touch component built around it 
um, that helps us accomplish and find data-driven and methodical solutions to both of those challenges. Finding the right partners, whether you're a nonprofit or a corporate corporation, and measuring those partnerships. So we work with through that some of the best in the industry. Thank you for some of you that are on the line who are part of the Catalyst family. Um, but we work with both sides of the aisle, and because of that, have a pretty intimate knowledge as to what is going on. Um, try to keep our finger on the pulse and learn from all of you. Um, and that's really what we've done in the last few months. We've actually conducted uh, two different surveys and studies to help us continue to publish uh, ongoing trends. As we know, our landscape within social impact is ever evolving, ever changing, um, and drastically moving very quickly um, at, a, at a pace that I don't think we've seen uh, in the past. And so we conducted a qualitative study, uh, which was essentially, um, you know, a source of interviews uh, from hundreds of different corporate social responsibility executives and um, got their, uh, you know, perspective on what they saw the future of uh, CSR being uh, in the, you know, in the coming years, um, what they were seeing, what they've experienced and what they foresee. Uh, and then we also balance that out with a quantitative study with consumers to really go straight to the source uh, of those stakeholders um, and ask, you know, are the issues that you care about the same that you cared about five, 10 years ago? What do you want from your companies? Not just in the typical statistics we've heard of from other studies in terms of, yes, I would purchase this brand over others, uh, but really specifically and tactically what they're looking for in terms of transparency, reporting, impact, and so on. So that study, um, as well as an ebook around all of these trends, will be coming out and published right after Labor Day, and we'll dive into a lot of it in a deeper way at BBCon. Um, but we're going to tease a little bit of it for you today. Um, so moving into uh, talking through these trends, you know, we find probably the most poignant common theme uh, whether you are a nonprofit organization on the line today or a corporation on the line today, um, really sort of stems from this idea um, of evolution. Um, and we'll, I'll, I'll specifically talk about this a little bit more. And so you see this beautiful sort of picture of a caterpillar here, um, kind of a pretty caterpillar, much, much better than the ones I find around my uh, home. But the question here is, you know, what do caterpillars have to do um, you know, with CSR, purpose, social impact, whatever you want to call it. And for the purposes of, of this webinar and any other conversation that we would have with you in person or online, we use all of those terms to identify and define uh, the industry that we, that we live in, um, just to sort of level set. Everybody has their own term for it. It is the umbrella of, of a purpose-driven brand or purpose-driven partnerships. Um, whether it's cause marketing or traditional CSR, sustainability, purpose, social impact, whatever you want to call it, that's what we're talking about, All any and all of the above. Um, but we wanted to ask the question, what do Caterpillars have to do with this? And, you know, we have a little chat box here, and I always love when giving a webinar to have some sort of interaction with you guys because it's so difficult to not be in person and have uh, and build kind of a rapport as we go through. So if you want to use in the Q&A or the team chat or... Um, whichever functionality we can use here, um, post the answer that you think uh, what Caterpillars have to do with social impact. Um, would love to hear your thoughts, but I'm going to continue going since we only have 30 minutes here and we have a lot to get to. Um, but the idea here that we like to talk about uh, in terms of evolution, or in this case, metamorphosis, is you know if Caterpillars really never became what they were meant to be, right? What would happen? I mean, they're beautiful. They're lovely. They, you know, crawl around our gardens. And some of these, in this case, I didn't even know caterpillars existed that looked uh, this unique. Um, but the fact of the matter is, if they just stopped there, they would never, of course, be able to evolve and fly and see the world and, you know, help our entire ecosystem and, and really um, reach their, their potential. Now, I know that's sort of maybe a hokey kind of uh, analogy, but what we see is really the driving theme behind all of the trends we'll talk about today. And I think ultimately throughout our industry, um, five, 10 years ago, and now moving forward is really the doing good 
the donating of funds, the philanthropic initiatives, the I'm just going to do and give back to the community from a brand perspective because it's the right thing to do is no longer good enough. And we're going to talk about why it's no longer good enough through uh, the discussion of some of these trends. And then also really illustrate some of those that are doing it well. Um, but that's that's sort of a common theme and a common thread you'll hear us at Cal Catalyst talk about a lot, um, that doing good, just giving, just engaging, just supporting a cause and having social impact or CSR or philanthropy sit over here in the corner as a separate department that does not integrate or connect or is held accountable, quite frankly, for the impact on the other business units within your company is no longer good enough and it must evolve and has to evolve for companies and causes, quite frankly, to remain competitive, to remain differentiating and to capture and, con and uh, contain and keep employees and consumers. It's no longer an option. I say all the time, uh, as do other social impact as a brand is no longer the exception, but it is the expectation and it's no longer good enough to just do the status quo. We have to do more. So what does that really mean? And thank you guys for um, <laughs> your answers. I love that it's colorful. That is true. Social impact in comparison to caterpillars, that they're colorful. Fantastic. Michael, you, you sort of hit the nail on the head there and that it is changing dramatically, but it has to change in order to, to survive, right? And so as we look at sort of some of the pinnacle brands, that have done this um, evolution and have really upheld the mantra of why doing good is not good enough. Um, we, of course, a lot of us, many of us have heard the Patagonia story. We have probably, you know, especially heard some of their recent activity um, around, you know, a variety of, of political issues. But the fact of the matter is if Patagonia, Patagonia is always since, since the eighties, in case some of you aren't familiar with their business model, they've always stood for and have always given 1% of their sales or 10% of their profits back to social causes. That was the fabric that they were built on that their CEO at the time and their founder believed in. That was back in the eighties, you guys, over 30 years ago. So if they just stopped at that, we would all look to them as a brand and say, yeah, they're, they're philanthropic. That's great but it didn't do anything. It wouldn't have done anything to really propel and project their brand into what it is today. And what does that mean in terms of tactics? Maybe you know these stats already. We're going to talk about them just specifically, but because they highly integrated what they were doing into every facet of their company from advertising to marketing, to HR, to uh, retail activation, um, to production, uh, every single facet, they were able to only have an attrition rate. We know how important employees are, right, to companies in terms of social impact and using social impact to lower attrition. The industry average in terms of attrition is 20%, you guys. Patagonia, because of what they stand for, because of their culture of giving, culture of social impact within the company, is only 4.5% because of all of this, because of this evolution, they founded the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, which is the coalition of, I believe, 80 different plus brands that have made a commitment to sustainable um, apparel production. They've become one of the first and were the first California-based B Corp. They turned the ad industry on its head a couple years ago around Giving Tuesday, if you, don't, if you recall, um, with this big, bold ad that says, don't buy our jackets to actually encourage um, not more spending, but more sustainable support um, around their common threads initiative. Don't buy this jacket, use it again, wear it again. It's still great. Because of that ad campaign, because of other integrated approaches, they actually have tripled their profits over the last five years. And their Q1 earnings for this year are up nearly a quarter, um, 25%. And so if you look at, well, that's nice and that would be great, but it's too hard or that's a lot of work or I got to get leadership by, and there are all these excuses that we can all make. But the fact of the matter is brands like Patagonia and others, and we'll talk about another one here in a second. If you evolve, if you don't stop at just becoming that caterpillar or just becoming that um, philanthropic donor, 
um, you can exponentially affect and effectuate the outcome of a brand. Another great example of this, and this is still sort of an ongoing story um, that we're, we're watching on the outside looking in of how CVS will continue to evolve and impact their own business model. Um, what if CVS, for example, stopped at simply giving away the millions and millions of dollars that they used to give away and still do to blue chip nonprofit organizations, the American Cancer Society, various peer to peer events? That's great. And as consumers, five, 10 years ago, we all would say, oh, aren't they great? Aren't they a supportive community partner? No longer good enough for us as consumers, regardless of what demographic you fall in, and certainly not for those Gen Zs that are coming up right behind us. If you saw the recent Forbes article that was released maybe yesterday, the day before, around the impact that Gen Zs will have on social impact and the trajectory of brand engagement with their consumers. It is a demand. So in the course of CBS, we all know of their commitment to stopping the sell of all tobacco products. They were the first pharmacy, first and only pharmacy to do that. Their revenues have actually increased. They took a slight dip uh, the year after that, which they expected, but they've actually started to increase consistently since then. Uh, and they're actually up by almost 3%, obviously, um, in Q1 of 2018. Um, after that dip, you can see they actually commit to and standing behind putting their sort of um, money where their mouth is, if you will, um, to not only stop the sell of tobacco products, but to convince or to consistently integrate that messaging throughout the store around, you know, stopping uh, smoking, quitting smoking, being a support mechanism for those uh, to uh, reduce, you know, the impact of smoking. Um, you, you may have seen their impact report a couple of years ago that said they actually helped to increase uh, or decrease rather the amount of um, smokers in the areas where they have 15% uh, market share or more by uh, 1% in just one year. Um, so they're you know slowly tracking that. Again, we'll be interested to see how that evolves, but they've become the first US-based pharmacy just recently outside of their commitment to tobacco-free um, product line. They also commit to joining the UN's global compact and reducing carbon, their carbon, carbon footprint. They have a 16% reduction in carbon intensity um, achieved over three years, or sorry, achieved now, which was three years ahead of schedule. Um, so they're really looking at not just standing for one cause, one issue, giving away money, um, but really in, impacting um, and integrating a commitment as a company to stand up for something they know will have an impact on community now and in the future, sometimes taking a sales hit, sometimes not, um, but eventually it's a long-term play. It's that marathon, not a sprint mentality. Um, so you will come back and circle back to these two case studies or, or success stories, really, as we talk about some of the other trends. Um, but it, you'll see some of those other trends we'll touch on permeate through some of the things that CVS and Patagonia did as well. So what are CSR executives right now, um, our experts, consumers, what are we all saying is sort of, uh, you know, the, the new wave of social impact as we start into the end of 2018 uh, beginning of 2019, and oh my goodness, we're getting to the 2020 mark. I remember when we used to say many years ago in school, what would happen in 2020, and now we're here. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a little crazy, but since we are, one of the main trends that we see is this permeation of consumer personalization um, into social impact. So we, we call this first trend, my cause, my way. And we're not talking about going back to the, the Pepsi refresh project um, because there were some benefits and challenges of that in terms of allowing consumers to just pick where money goes. But what we are saying is that consumers across a variety of different industries, as you can see here, whether it's QSR, whether it's CPG, whether it's media um, or what have you, you know, they are, we as consumers are used to personalization. This actual slide is from uh, another colleague's presentation from 2010, 2013, of how our, our industries in general were experiencing the influx of personalization. Well, guess what, you guys? Social impact is always a couple years late, right? In terms of catching on to trends. And this trend in terms of personalization is now impacting social impact. 
So let's talk a little bit about what that looks like. Um, so consumers say, uh, we all know this from the Cone stats uh, and the, the Cone Communications report that they publish every couple of years. They issued one last year as an update that 87% of consumers will purchase a product because a company advocated for an issue they cared about, not just gave away money, advocated, was actually taking action against this, right? 76% will actually refuse to purchase a product um, if they don't support or if they support an issue that's contrary to, the, to their beliefs. So the takeaway here is it has to resonate. And this sounds like a gimme or a, a light, you know, no, there's, this isn't a light bulb moment. Maybe you've thought about it many times. But the causes that we care about as companies the, and the partnerships that we choose as companies have to resonate with our consumers and all stakeholders, quite frankly, meaning employees. Um, and so you can see here the honest company. Um, it's not just, oh, our consumers like the environment or our employees um, are passionate about mentorship. Um, and they want to get involved with an organization that's a mentoring organization. It really is about that company looking at how do brands activate consumers and employees alongside the brand and give them the tools to be philanthropic, give them the tools to have a deeper relationship with your brand. And as Christopher uh, Gavigan says here at, from the honest company, you know, his ultimate goal, um, is to, is to become an agent. Um, for their consumers uh, to to help cons their consumers meet their philanthropic goals. So it's not, you know, just about resonance. It's about really understanding, yes, which causes make sense, which partnerships make sense, how do they want to engage, what types of engagement level do they want to have, and what does that look like for both our consumers and our employees, right? So as you're thinking about how to kind of bring this back into your own companies, um, you know, maybe consider the question, how can I better align our company's commitment to social causes um, that are meaningful to our actual consumers and employees, right? Now I have a couple of use cases here. We're going to, we're going to fast forward through those and maybe save those for the BBCon session um, of how other brands have used, uh, you know, issue mapping and, cause resonance data um, to actually help them answer that question. As we go through, I would love for you guys to say yay, nay. Um, I'm seeing this trend in the Q&A box. I'm also witnessing this trend from my perspective, or this is brand new to me, um, or I would like to hear more about that trend. And we can handle all of that um, kind of in our follow-up too. We want this to try to be as interactive as we can, and then also help to, to shape our BB concession and make it even better for you guys. So the second trend, uh, you know, I just said this the other day when I was in a room uh, with a, a room full of ad agency executives. Um, and we, we partner at Catalyst uh, with, you know, we provide the data and, and they're the data provider for a lot of ad agencies and PR agencies out there in terms of social impact strategy. And so I was standing there and we were talking about some of their brand clients. And we said, you know what? <clears throat> when you stand for everything, you stand for nothing. And this really goes to a trend that we're seeing with more mature brands, more sophisticated brands that have a lot of different quote unquote giving pillars or CSR pillars or social impact pillars. Um, and they support gender equality and nutrition and animal welfare and um, you know, human rights and water programs. And it, it's sort of all over the map um, because of maybe an evolution, um, you know, from what made sense for their brand to what made sense to a consumer to what made sense or where an executive had a personal relationship. Uh, whatever the rhyme or reason, a lot of sophisticated and more mature brands are in this scenario of needing to refine what they stand for so that it actually makes sense. And I'm not saying just pick one thing, but let's pick two, three, five things, uh, five issues, five social causes, whatever the, the right fit is for you and your consumers that makes sense uh, for all stakeholders, makes sense for your business model, and isn't a um, sort of a social cause or social issue, issue soup to where the consumer is confused who you as a brand uh, support or stand for and why. Um, and so you can see here some of the stats from our current study that's coming up. 
that 71% of those CSR professionals say that they are actually reevaluating and or refining the causes their company supports because we can no longer just stay and, and stand on our laurels or rest on our laurels of saying, this is good enough. We supported health or we supported food or nutrition or hunger or whatever it was five, 10 years ago. And we're going to just stay there because that seems to work good enough for us. No longer works. We have to evolve. We have to reevaluate. And we have to do that from a data-driven perspective because strategy is only an opinion until it's grounded in data and really evolve uh, our social impact strategies in one way. You can see here our friends at Mondelez um, talk about this shift. Um, to support, you know, one or two main signature programs or issues that are core to your business. So looking at not only what resonates with your consumers, but who are you as a company? What are your core values as a brand? And then where does that Venn diagram to put those two halves together? What resonates with your consumers and employees, who you are as a brand, bring that together and really identify what makes sense for you. So considering this second trend, map the issues that your stakeholders care about and very simply map those against your core values um, to really identify the leaders of the pack for you. So I can see here in the Q&A, um, someone from Soapbox uh, wants to hear that 20 second synopsis. Um, we'll come back to that in the Q&A, I promise. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that. If our friends from Harry's are on the phone, uh, maybe you can chime in too, Maggie, if you're, if you're on the line. Uh, so we'll come back to some of these questions. Please capture them here. Keep going as we go along so we don't forget. Um, we can also talk a little bit more in the Q&A about issue mapping and how that looks and what does that look like from a data-driven perspective and how do you really, really, uh, from a statistical standpoint, from a methodology standpoint, look at certain causes, um, your engagement with certain causes or social issues, the level at which you stand up for are a voice in, are an industry leader in versus what you're just supporting because it's a good sponsorship opportunity. Um, how to really look at and analyze all that. We can get to the how um, a little bit later if we have some time. So the third trend here um, is, is really stemming from and is driven from a lot of various uh, perspectives. One is that proliferation of the Gen Z influence and that they will surpass millennials in the coming years or already have in terms of volume. Their influence is unparalleled and will be moving forward. Of course, everybody wants to talk about still the millennial demographic, although that's changed. That has changed from five years ago when millennials were young singles or students. And now, um, you know, we see that growing up of millennials and the, the millennial moms and parents Nevertheless, whatever demographic you're in, what we are seeing is that consumers in general, employees in general, don't just want you to have a flashy ad campaign that supports some socio-political issue um, that is a hot topic at the moment. If you're going to talk about gender equality, they want to see you as a brand and they're going to hold you accountable as a brand to take action against gender equality, to do something about it to put that your money where your mouth is, um, to back up those claims. And that's really what this trend is about. So you can see here specifically around Gen Z, 94% of them believe that companies should help address social and environmental issues, not just from an all talk perspective, but from an action, taking action. Um, Dave Stangis, uh, our friend over at Kimball Soup, you guys have, may, may know him, may have heard from him. Uh, he's out on the you know thought leadership sort of circuit a lot. Um, he talks here about the role that we all expect companies to play through investing in specific initiatives, improving communities, walking the walk and talking the talk, um, and how that really impacts consumers, employees, stakeholders in measurable results. Again, across that cross-departmental, multidisciplinary perspective, workplace productivity, employee engagement, brand loyalty, sales lift, so on and so on and so on. So we have to talk to each other. We have to work together. A great case study and use case is this up and coming brand in Everlane. And it's again, one of those millennial slash Gen Z brands, um, but they certainly have built their brand around purpose. They are a leader in sustainable apparel. 
Um, they actually invite their consumers, talk about in consumer engagement um, and personalization and walking the walk. They actually invite consumers to witness exactly where, who, and how you know their clothes are made. They've created a community of consumers that encourages feedback around their key social impact principles, the processes in which they make their clothes, the production um, facilities where their clothes are made. And they actually, to take it a step further, actually reveal the true price of each product so the consumer can really understand where they're, you know, what they're paying for and how their margin, what their margins look like. I mean, that is uber transparency if I've ever seen it. And we say this to not say you have to go become the next Everlane, but these are the types of up and coming companies that are capturing consumer hearts, whether they're new or old consumers or sophisticated or seasoned consumers. Um, but this is now setting the bar at a higher level uh, for all of those more established brands who might not have this business model. That's okay. But there are other ways to take action and back up what you're talking about out in the public. Consumer trend three here, um, do our actions back up our words? Are we transparent enough? So again, running along that same line um, of, you know, are we walking the walk? That That's really what we're gonna ask ourselves internally um, to, to apply that trend of, of a little less action, sorry, a little less conversation, a little more action. Trend four, measurement. Now you guys, we talk about measurement all day long. Um, we, it's what, you know, we do a big part of at, uh, catalysts. We're not just talking social, uh, or community measurement. We're not just talking media or, uh, impression or marketing measurement. We're not just talking bottom line measurement. We're talking all of it. And in an ideal world, we would be measuring all of it. And that's the goal is to have a 360 degree view of measurement. There's been a lot of movement and a lot of talk, um, about, community measurement, um, value chain measurement, uh, you know, reducing your carbon footprint. And there are a lot of metrics being put in place around that, which is fantastic. But we've also, as an industry, forgotten about, well, how does that affect my marketing and media? Um, and what's, you know, what are consumers actually saying about this partnership or saying about this commitment? And do they feel positively or negatively about it? What does that look like in terms of my sales, in terms of my share price if I'm a public company, so on and so on and so on. But we also know measurement is very overwhelming. It is a marathon, again, not a sprint, and it is a long-term play. So you see here the importance of measurement. 86% of consumers we unveiled or revealed and found out in our current study say it's important to understand the social impact of the brands they shop with and support. Super important. Um, and you can see here that even in the B2B market uh, with our, our friends over at Suffolk Constru Construction, that they understand sustainable success. Um, they say you can't manage what you can't measure. And so to, to really achieve long-term success for them, tracking and measuring real data, key performance indicators or KPIs that are tied directly to retention, recruitment for them, not necessarily consumers, because that's not their cup of tea. Um, that's really how they can improve. So if we're going to invest in integrating and in establishing a cross-departmental CSR strategy, why? in the world would we not measure cross-departmentally, right? But the thing that I wanna tell you guys here um, is that yes, we wanna measure, yes, we need to measure, but what can we measure right now? How do we take baby steps to prove to leadership that measurement is needed, to prove to leadership what can be measured and what can be valued against our return on investment? Um, and how do we create a three or five year plan around measurement? Um, and so the key kind of questions that we encourage you guys to ask yourself is as a company, it's not a one size fits all. We can't, you know, create any, any strategy across industry or uh, structure mechanism or giving mechanism that fits every single company. So you have to customize it for yourself. So internally ask first and foremost, what do we want to measure? What's important for us? If the trend is to measure cross departmentally, then let's talk about that. Ideally, that's our goal. What do we need to measure? to justify our existence as the social impact non-revenue generating department within a company. And what can we measure right now? So what can we start with, right? Um, and so those are some of the conversations we encourage you to have internally. Last trend here, you guys. Social impact going back to the emergency broadcast system. <laughs> um, social impact is not a test. Um, 
It is a commitment. It is a long-term commitment. And sometimes that does take internal education of leadership. We have seen a lot of CEOs, a lot of C-suites really embrace this idea of long-term commitment, partially because of um, Larry Fink and the BlackRock open letter earlier this year that's putting even more pressure on CEOs from an investment standpoint. Um, and if any of you are not familiar with that, obviously the BlackRock letter from Larry Fink talked about how they are no longer investing in companies that don't stand for something. Um, so there's pressure from investors, there, there's pressure from consumers and employees. So we've seen CEOs get it now, but sometimes it does take a little internal education. But the fact of the matter is, it's no longer, as you see here uh, from Patsy uh, Doer uh, at Thompson Router, Reuters, sorry, that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's not long, there's no longer this sort of separate department that sits in the corner and it's that nice to have area that we're just giving away and we're just doing good to do good because it's the right thing to do. That's an archaic um, view of social impact. And now we are seeing this integration. So integration takes uh, long-term planning. Um, it takes commitment from everyone uh, in the long-term and in education sometimes that um, what to expect in the near term and what to expect in the long term. Um, it's not something that you can just say, oh, we're going to slap our logo on something, generate some sales, um, you know, slap our cause, a cause on our brand and, um, and, you know, be done with it. It should be a very serious commitment. You can see here that 93% of executive respondents in a Boston College Center study uh, reported success in achieving their business goals when their corporate citizenship efforts are supported for four or more years. So you can see that longevity play there, um, that it's not just a one-year budget, a two-year budget. It's four or five or six or 10 years before you really will see that multidisciplinary impact. So the big question that I believe internally we should all ask ourselves as brands is, is our executive team bought in to social impact and purpose integration? And if they are bought in, are the middle markets bought in? And if they're not, then what does that leadership message message need to look like from the top down? Um, so I know that was a really quick run through. And I, I also know that some of the attendees on the phone are from the corporate sector and from the nonprofit sector. And what I will say is these are mostly framed um, from a corporate audience perspective, but as nonprofit executives going into building partnerships, uh, either with new brands and, and companies or improving and stewarding and growing your existing partnerships, you should be the expert in the room, bring these trends to your partnerships and talk about them. Talk about how can we adopt one of these trends within our particular partnership or, and talk to your leadership to say, listen, this is, this is what's happening in our industry. And these are the resources or the support that we need and we're going to be held to and held accountable for to support these types of partnerships, reporting, impact, measurement, expertise, all of those things are wrapped into um, a lot of these trends. Now, I know that we went through that very quickly. So we're going to talk about Q&A a little bit, if that's okay, Daniel, I, I want to be cognizant of time here. Yes, that's yeah, it. Okay. okay. So, Omri, you uh, from uh, Soapbox, you said, uh, you know, we'd love to hear a, a 20 second synopsis. So I will uh, bring that back to the Harry's example in terms of issue mapping. Um, and again, I, I did see Maggie from Harry's uh, signed up or registered for this uh, webinar. If you're on the line, feel free to chime in here through the chat box. If you're not, we can circle back later. <laughs> um, but what we did for Harry's essentially is, you know, they were wondering and he had a really good idea of where they wanted to take um, their social impact. As you, you know, if you know, Harry's the shaving company, um, it was founded by the, the former, you know, co-founder of Warby Parker. It was based and built around a purpose um, mentality, a social purpose mentality and around that, that culture of giving. And they have been very philanthropic and very supportive in terms of walking the walk and talking the talk over the past few years um, that they've been in business. So they've had longstanding partnerships with organizations like Movember and City Year. Um, but they were sort of at that crossroads again to say, and were progressive in their own thinking to say, you know what, 
Um, should we continue to go down the same road we've been down or how should we be evolving what we're doing and maybe the causes that we should be supporting um, or the organizations we should be partnering with um, in terms of, you know, moving forward. And they had this whole idea of redefining, they wanted to redefine masculinity from a brand value perspective. Um, and so they had some ideas, they had some ideas based on qualitative studies with focus groups um, and, and some of their consumers um, on which direction they might be going down. Uh, at, at Catalyst, actually, we did a psychosocial analysis of their actual social followers and customers um, to identify a little bit deeper as to who these people were, of course, demographically and psychographically, but also from a cause affinity and organizational affinity perspective. So we sort of built out this persona and really helped to bridge the gap between say and do. So we call it the say-do gap, right? Of if you ask somebody what they're doing, they can say they're doing one thing, but what they actually end up doing is another thing. Um, and so we were actually able to measure what are they talking about? What causes are they donating to? What um, you know causes and organizations are they are they volunteering for? What really matters, and what does that look like? And this is a very very high level snapshot of their uh, overall persona. Of course, his name's Harry. Um, but you can see the, the most loved causes here were not necessarily men's health, um, which is what they've supported primarily in the past of mental health and, and men's health around Movember um, and mentorship around city year. It was human rights. It was public policy. It was health, but it was HIV AIDS in particular. It was hunger, community development, a very robust view and a very robust snapshot of the causes that they care about. Um, and then some of the organizations that fell within that, like the ACLU or GLAD or Planned Parenthood, you know, these guys maybe are foodies. And so they're very um, much supporters of the James Beard Foundation and, of course, supporters of Feeding America. But yet they love to maybe eat Girl Scout cookies and support the Girl Scouts of America in terms of community development. So it's not a one size fits all. It's not, hey, we're looking at, you know, men aged with an average age of 40 and this is who they are. Um, because they're of that demographic, it's these are our consumers. These are people that are purchasing and supporting our brand. Who do they love? What do they care about? And maybe that is very different from what we thought. Maybe it's uh, in parallel, but it tells us a bigger story and a different story of how to activate and engage them. And that's essentially what Harry's ended up doing with this data is building it into uh, their overall social impact strategy that led to decisions like, you know, changing their razor to a rainbow razor and, and supporting GLAD for the month of, of June, Pride Month this past year, and other initiatives that they have coming up. So it confirmed a lot of what they knew, debunked some things or unveiled some new things that they didn't know, um, and really helped them refine on a very specific level what their strategy should be. So uh, Joan, you asked, uh, does that mean that companies are narrowing their portfolios and that number of partnerships are conceivably shrinking as a result? I would say they are being more strategic. Um, they are narrowing and refining and or reevaluating. Um, so even the more reason as a nonprofit to find your value proposition, differentiate not only your cause uh, from the others, but, but really find the right companies. You know, it might not be that Fortune 1000 or Fortune 100 company that you thought was a good fit or that maybe was a good fit five, 10 years ago um, to really understand the value proposition for the company along the lines of brand fit, consumer fit, uh, shared value, uh, you know, the value of your people, your expertise, not necessarily put your logo here or there. That's, that's gone. That was 20 years ago. Um, really identifying and hyper-targeting uh, who you should be partnered with, I think is, is maybe a solution to your point to a more strategic approach by brands um, as to which causes they stand for and organizations they partner with. So you guys feel free to ask any other questions. I'm happy to answer them now, or if you'd like to take it offline, happy to do that too. Daniel, did you have any any other questions coming through? No, I don't see any others coming through at this time. Um, but they can, of course, contact us offline. Uh, they can contact you directly, or they can contact us at Blackboard using the email solutions at blackboard.com.
So if we don't see any coming in. Oh, maybe one more yep. here. Um, yep. Yeah, so uh, the question is, what is the role or title of the person within a company that typically engages, I guess, catalyst? Um, and so to that answer, it's, <laughs> it's, it's everybody, um, depending on who holds the key to social impact as a broad umbrella. So that could be the head of a, a corporate foundation, um, the marketing and PR person. It could be uh, the HR person. It, as we all know, um, unfortunately, although our, our industry is becoming still very much more sophisticated, um, where that person lies and who that gatekeeper is still sits in different departments depending on the company. Um, so it does, it does vary uh, for sure. It could be one, one of the above, all of the above. Uh, our ideal scenario is to have multiple points of contact within the company, of course, because we support that multiple, multiple uh, multidisciplinary cross-functional approach. Okay, great. I think we'll probably cut it off there. Um, again, if you have any questions, email us at solutions at blackbond.com or you can visit our resource hub of corporations.blackbond.com. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you, Brittany, for your time and everyone else for joining us today. Uh, we'll use that to conclude our webinar. Uh, I hope everyone has a great rest of the week. Thank you so much, Daniel, for having me and thank you all for attending. Look forward to BBCon. <laughs>